but just, just excuse me real quick. Uh, can everyone just smile for me? <laughs> All right, here we uh, so One, two, three, cheese. Awesome, thanks. That's my, that's my favorite app. That's, uh, that's called Foursquare, not, not the cigarette. But it's, a, it's a social app, and so when you check everything in, uh, it goes up online, it shares with all my friends. And in the background, they're using uh, MapReduce to uh, track and give you suggestions and give you suggestions to your friends and to visualize what people are checking in. So I'll talk about that a little bit today. So my name is uh, Joe Ziegler. I am an evangelist for Amazon Web Services. I'm based out of Australia. Uh, and I'm happy to be here. I want to thank the organizers for having us here today. Amazon loves big data. I'm going to cover uh, three points, three basic ideas. I talk a little bit about some characteristics about big data, and I have no doubt that many of you actually know all these characteristics, but I want to talk to them in the framework of why the cloud helps enable big data. I want to talk about how the cloud is big data's best friend, BFF, and, and how big data is used currently in the cloud, in the real world. And so I'll talk about a few case studies Specifically, uh, ones that I'm familiar with, which are, are ones using Amazon Web Services, uh, but certainly can apply to anybody using the cloud. So what are some of the characteristics of big data? Well, when we talk about big data, we mean data that's so big and so large and encompassing that you actually have to innovate in order just to collect, store, organize, analyze, and share it. So it's such a massive amount of information that it just takes innovation just to hold on to it. For big data, the bigger the data, the better the data. The more you can collect, the more valuable the data is. Right? So you take a company like Yelp. Yelp uses big data to correct, to get recommendations and corrections when people type in and search on Yelp. The more data that collects in, the more mistakes, the more correct answers too, the better the recommendations can, can happen. If you ever, has anyone shopped uh, on Amazon.com before? Yeah. So that recommendation engine that runs the back end, of course, that is that's completely powered by the analytics that it collects. Well, not only you are shopping, but while other people are shopping, that gets better and better as you shop more, as it collects more data. Those recommendations when you buy one book, recommending another book, or complementary item, those get better as the data gets bigger. But bigger data is harder data. And it's not just harder because uh, there's more of it, but it's also coming from different sources, right? So you're not dealing with just one source of data now. You have to collect multiple different sources in multiple different formats. Not only that, but once that data gets bigger than you can store on one machine, now you have to come out with some methodology to shard that data over different storages. Right? So your traditional IT infrastructure, if you're trying to store petabytes of data, you have to have some very high-end infrastructure in order to store that. Or you're going to have a lot of hard drives that you know, stack up on the side of the wall, take a terabyte each, right? So big data is getting bigger. So it's accelerating at this point. We're going to have more and more data. We're going to have, according to uh, IDC, 2.7 zettabytes of data by this year. Who, who knows what a zettabyte is? That's better than I was going to say, right? So it's a, it's a thousand exabytes. That's a lot of data, right? That's a lot of data. And a lot of it's going to be unstructured, right? This is going to be data coming in from lots of different sources. Uh, this is going to be data that's coming from different places, spread and stored in different areas, right? Not only that, but the requirements are changing for data. The way we use this big data, that is also changing. So, for example, people want immediate answers to the questions that big data can uh, supply. There's no more waiting for, for, the, for processing. We want answers right now, right? When I, when I type in that book name in uh, Amazon, I want those recommendations right now. There's no value to Amazon. If we send an email two weeks later and say, hey, by the way, you know that book you bought? Here's another book that's kind of like it. Well, you, your transaction's done at that point, right? We don't want sampling anymore. In the old days, back when I was young, you could do sampling, right? You could say, you know what, I just want to take a little bit of this data, and I want to project it, I want to guess that. Those days are gone, right? Right now, you can get accurate answers because of big data. But it's getting more complex, right? The old tools are no longer applicable because of the amount of data. SQL is no longer enough of a language to describe how we want to process that data. Relational databases can't contain all this information. 
And people want to experiment with data, right? They want to be able to play with the data, to ask questions on the data. But in order to do that, I don't want to book time on a supercomputer or have to pay and provision tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of hardware in order to ask these questions. <laughs> so where is some of this data coming from? A lot of it's computer generated, right? So we have more and more online services, right? We have Twitter, we have Facebook. Right? These systems are also talking to each other, right? The web server logs are talking, or web servers are talking to other backend systems. Sensor data, right? Closed caption cameras, traffic data. All of this is being captured at a growing and growing rate. Uh, blogs, email, pictures. I don't know about you guys, but I look I look at the amount of pictures I had when I was a kid. There's about my parents have about six pictures of me between the ages of like one to twenty. Right? Or maybe they didn't love me, I don't know. But I can tell you what, I already took like twenty pictures today. You know. Think about how much that's growing. We all have everyone here has a camera right in their pocket right now. That's all generating data for us. So the role of data is changing, right? It used to be that we would construct the models that we wanted for that data, and then collect that data. So I come from a software engineer background, and I would design schemas based upon how I wanted that data to look, right? So I would design a schema for my order entry system. Maybe I design a schema for my customers. I would do that ahead of time. That's changing now, right? That data's coming in. We want to collect that data, and that data is driving the model. We flip it around, right? We don't know what questions we're going to ask. This is moving to a data-first philosophy. Collect as much data as you can. Don't worry about the structure. Don't worry about how you're going to ask about it. Later, you'll figure that out. So you have, you have innovations. For example, in Singapore, the, uh, the government has collected massive amount of traffic data over the years. Taxis. They've got sensors in their taxis so they know where everything's going. They've collected all this data not knowing how they're going to use it. And now they're making it publicly available. Anybody in Singapore who wants to use it to improve life in Singapore. They have public access to that. These innovations are going to be driven, not because they knew ahead of time what they're going to do with that data, but after that they had the data, they asked themselves, well, we can use this. Right? We can improve our traffic situations. We can make taxis. So now data is really a first class, uh, first class citizen. Right? Data is the same as people, as labor, as capital. It's that important. Right? It's the industrial revolution of this decade. Right. Some people say it might be the web, web 3.0. It's that important. There are going to be entire economies that are driven by big data. So right now, we're kind of in this transition phase, right? We've got a lot of tools that are based on traditional IT infrastructure, right? We've got relational databases. We've got SQL. Right? We've got hard drives. We've got vendors who want to sell you, you know, SANS, right? The tools are going to start changing. Now, I'm sure that many of you guys know about Hadoop. And Hadoop, Hadoop is almost is almost that game-changing tool now. You can see that being the beginning of a bunch of new tools that are going to be coming and built on top of the backbone of Hadoop. You can think about this. This is, I would say, it's like DOS in the, in the '70s for those of you who were old like me, uh, or maybe Java in the '90s. Right? It's going to be that watershed moment now. And why is Hadoop so important? Hadoop's really important because it's provided a couple of really basic features that is, is going to enable all these other tools and, and enable us to be able to use this big data a lot easier. And one of the big things is it allows you to use commodity computing, right? If you've got an x86 server sitting place, someplace, you can use that to process big data, right? You don't need any special equipment. And in fact, if you haven't had a thousand x86 computers working around, Hadoop will help you do that, right? Because Hadoop, the other thing about Hadoop is allow you to scale out. Allow you to scale horizontally. Those two features together make Hadoop very, very important. And it solves many problems. So it solves some really basic fundamental problems. How do you break down data? How do you move it around? How do you chop it up, slice it up, analyze it, and then put it back together? But at the end of the day, Hadoop's still kind of hard. So has anyone here managed a Hadoop cluster at all? Try to. It's hard, right? I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of setup for that. There's a lot of work. And while you're doing that, while you're setting up that Hadoop cluster, are you using that big data? Are you are you actually asking any questions? You're not. You're setting up infrastructure, right? 
And, and these skills, these people that are setting up the do, these are really rare IT skills right now. So IT itself is you know, obviously a very rare specialized skill. Big data IT skills, well, good luck. Good luck being able to hire people with that skill set. Do you want them setting up servers? Or do you want them using that data? Do you want them building something you know, for your customers or answering the questions that you want to answer? So how does the cloud look? And I'm going to speak very generically about the cloud, not specifically the Amazon cloud, although that's the one that I kind of like. So just to kind of be clear, I'm sure everybody here, and the way we talk about the cloud is we define it in five uh, customer benefits, right? The cloud has to be elastic. You should be able to spin up as many machines as you want, anytime you want. And you should be able to shrink that and send that back up to us for cost savings. If it's not elastic, it's not the, it's not the cloud to us, right? If, you're, if you have limited capacity, it's not cloud computing. You shouldn't have any CapEx, so no capital expenditure. You shouldn't have to buy anything ahead of time to use the cloud. No contracts, you shouldn't have to lay out money. You should be able to pay on a per use consumption based model. For every hour you use it, you pay. When you turn it off, you don't pay for it. And it should enable you a faster time to market. <coughs> and the reason it should be doing that is you're not setting up machines. You don't care about the physical infrastructure. Well, maybe some of you, some of you guys like to build computers at home, and that's fine. But when you want to use that computing power, you don't want to sit there and have to rack up these machines. You don't have to cool them. You don't have to edit them, right? And allow them to focus on what you're doing. And for big data scientists, that means you're not sitting there wasting time with big machines, right? You're trying to get something done. So how does that make uh, the cloud big data's best friend? Well, as we said, there's really a few big problems we have with big data that we're trying to solve, or the big pain points. We want to collect it, store it, organize it, analyze it, and share it. But we all have limited resources, right? We have only, there's only so many computers, there's only so many people. So how does the cloud help that? Well, first of all, as I said before, if you're not spending those Hadoop clusters, if you're not trying to scale on databases, you're saving on a very, very precious IT commodity. You're saving on these people who have necessary skills that are extremely important to your organization. If you have somebody, you know, as you're collecting enough data and you realize you're running out of hard drive space and the guy's having to talk to some vendor and he's having to run out and get a machine to hook it together, he's not working on, on delivering you value. He's just keeping you running. And an interesting study you might see is that the data is going to grow by 75 times in the future. But the amount of people that are actually going to use to be able to manage that only going to be 1.5. So that IT commodity is going to be even more precious. So if you're wasting time not using that data, you're going to fall behind. Hadoop is a Hadoop charge. Right? That was my, that's my, me and my university apartment. I was very lonely, but I had a lot of computers. Um, but Hadoop, it, it's, a, it's a hard, a hard thing to run. You have to, you have to program for Hadoop. You have to set up a machine. You have to work with it. So what happens in the old world, if you're not using cloud computing, Gartner says that we've been in the old world for bigger IT companies. They spend about 30% of their time doing something creative, creating something for their customers, differentiating themselves in the marketplace, creating programming code. 70% of the time, they're just keeping the lights on. 70% of the time, they're just keeping things running. Right? How many times have you, you, know, you needed to use a resource and, gosh, you had to get someone to procure a server? Or your email went down? Or your database got so what we want to be able to do with cloud computing is we want to switch that around. And you, you still have to, of course, manage some things, right? There's a there's some management overhead. We want, to, we want to flip it so you're spending 75% of your time actually able to use that, that information. So you really come to four big points on how the cloud helps you. It creates reusability. If you set up your infrastructure in a certain way, you can snapshot it, you can reuse it, right? If you set up a new cluster, even if you want to set it up by yourself, by hand, you can copy that and replicate it over and over. If you have a production environment that perhaps is processing big data and you've got an issue, you can copy it and bring it into your environment for your development. A lot of cloud services have uh, managed services. So managed services, it takes that undifferentiated heavy lifting at 70% out of your, your own hands, and the provider, the cloud provider, deals with that. So for example, relational databases. Right? At Amazon, we've got something called Elastic MapReduce. Right? That is a managed, hosted Hadoop environment. You don't have to set it to scale. <laughs> You have a massive amount of scale when you're dealing with cloud infrastructure, and it's scale at demand, right? So you'll find that the workflows for, especially for processing data, it's not a smooth workflow, right? We've got customers who, on the weekend, they have to process a massive amount of data, but 
but then during the week, they're done, right? So how do they scale up? How do they get tens of thousands of servers to, to process their data? And then, you know, truthfully, how to get, get rid of those servers that they're not using? So you get a massive amount of scale, not only for compute, but what about storage, right? How are you, you going to deal with pulling in petabytes of information? And innovation. Do you want to be discovering new technologies? And some of you might to actually process the big data, or do you want to be using that big data? Do you want to do you want to deal with new technologies on how to get more bytes on a hard drive? Is that your job? And in some of you, it might be your job, but for the rest of you, maybe you don't want to be working on that. And so, when you deal with the cloud, you're going to find that a lot of these providers they're innovating on behalf of their customers. They're getting feedback, right? They're saying, "Hey, I want support for this version of Hadoop. Hey, I want to use Hive." The cloud optimizes for capacity and resource. You don't have to think ahead when you use the cloud for big data, right? You don't have to plan for that project. You don't have to say to yourself, you know what, I have an idea, let's let's collect all this data, and I want to create a recommendation out of it, engine out of it, and uh, I'm going to need to store, let's say, a thousand terabytes. And then you have to go out and buy the thousand terabytes and, and provision it. And then maybe you find out you didn't want to use it, and now you, 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 you've created some risk, and you've created some waste, and you don't have to use that anymore. With the cloud, you don't have to worry about that. It's got that elasticity built in. So I talked a little bit about compute capacity. So you're going to have a very jagged kind of workflow when you're doing uh, big data analytics. You might have kind of this on and off type scenario, a fast growth scenario, peaks and valleys, maybe even predictable peaks. This could be like an internet startup. This could be an office between uh, like eight and nine, eight and ten. Think everyone's coming in logging in. So what happens in your traditional IT infrastructure? All of this, if you provision this amount of data or this amount of capacity, all of this is wasted. Right? Those are computers you're paying for that aren't doing anything. So you've you gone home for the day, you turn them off, and they're just sitting there. Maybe someone's stuck in the office and they're using to play games, but you know, it's, not, it's not making any money. You know, even with a fast growth and you've provisioned here, and you've tried to come up with a methodology so you're not wasting as much, it's still wasting. You know, it's basic calculus. A really bad situation is when you don't have enough scale. Right? And now you're not able to do the work that you want to be able to do. It's really a lose-lose situation when it comes to not using the cloud, right? You're either going to guess, and maybe you'll be close to right, and so you provision for an extra 15% of capacity or whatever you need to do, but you still wasted all that. Or you're going to be wrong, and you're not going to be able to get your job done like this for your customer. So what you need to be able to do is have provision capacity, right? So that's the power. I mean, any any of, any of the different types of providers, anyone using the clouds can give you that ability, right? When you need that that ability to process, regardless of what the pattern is, you're going to be able to have your capacity match what you need to get done, and that means your costs are going to match your revenue or whatever you're, you're judging as your revenue source. This allows you to balance cost and time. Now, it's an interesting uh, fact, especially when you're coming with using Hadoop or using any kind of distributed computing architecture. It doesn't matter how many machines that you have running, the costs are going to be the same, right? If you've got 500 instances running, it's going to cost you 500 hours of processing, right? If you've got one instance running it's, for 500 hours, it's going to cost you the same. So you are now empowered to decide how fast you want to process that data. It's your choice, which is you know great, and that's what. That's one of the things that we get we get out of Hadoop and Mapreduce, right? We get that ability to massively scale out. It also allows you to experiment. Now you don't have to provision a massive amount of, of physical infrastructure. It allows you to ask questions that maybe you weren't going to ask because the consequences are quite low, right? You, you're not sitting there having to put up a uh, bid to buy hardware, for example. You're not having to go through a provisioning process. You're also empowered to sit there and kick off maybe 10,000 servers for an hour and try it out. You can ask new questions now. That allows you to innovate. Right? You don't have to worry about the fear of failure, the high cost of failure. I actually I come from the startup world, and we always talk about fail fast. Right? So in the startup world, we, we adopt a lean and agile development. And the whole idea is, if you don't know the answer to something, don't guess. Do it. Find out from the market. Take that information back and iterate, and that's what we do. Is we do at Amazon a lot. We'll launch a very basic service. We'll let the market tell us what's happening. Sometimes maybe maybe we didn't launch the right thing. But you can do that. The same the same applies to big data. You can ask ask questions. You can experiment with this. 
the low consequence. It allows you to collect and store as much big data as you want. It's almost unlimited scale in using storage in the cloud. Right? You're not at that point where you have to decide, look, I'm out of space, I have to decide what to collect. Right? Collect what you want. Collect as much as you want. Right? If the cost is going down, the durability of storage in the cloud is very, very high. Right? And I'm going to use an example, it's going to be one of our, our storage products, but it applies to many types of storage in the cloud. We've got a storage product that we use quite a bit with big data. It's called Simple Storage Service, or S3. Uh, is, is, does anyone use Dropbox at all? Dropbox is, is all S3, right? And Dropbox uses it because it can put as much data as it wants to on it. Got a company in the US called Netflix. Netflix, sometimes it takes up to 25% of all the internet traffic in America. <coughs> it's the number one cable provider in America now. When people are watching those movies and they're trying to figure out you know, recommendations in it and advertising, they just throw all that into S3. They don't ever have to worry about how it scales out. Behind it, I'm sure there's trillions of drives over many data centers, but they don't have to worry about that. Right? This level of scale is so massive, like right now, as of today, we have a trillion objects in our, in our S3 buckets. An object is just any kind of file. So that means an object for, what, 156 objects for every man, woman, and child on the planet. You can store a massive amount of data. And not only that, but you can access that data uh, in a massive transactional format. You can, you can, if you use any kind of uh, MapReduce and you point it to something like an S3 bucket, it handles right now 750,000 requests per second. Right? So it removes one of those bottlenecks when you're trying to process it. And it's accessible basically everywhere. So another big problem is besides storing the data is how do you share it? Right? If you've got some mass amount of data, what are the benefits if you're able to share it with other people and they can process it? So what we've got, for example, are public data sets stored out in the cloud. So the Human Genome Project is up there. You can go ahead and process that anytime you want. Singapore, as we talked about before. Google Books and Ngrams, which are uh, basically the, the books are chopped up into different tools that you can use to process to figure out information about the literature. All that's just stored out in the cloud. You have complete access to that. Right? And the interesting thing, too, is the cost is going down to store, right? So that's fundamentally a big problem for big data. If the cost of storing data is high, you're not going to store it. But it's not. And the consequences of not storing the data now, now that big data is such an important pillar of business, means that that company is going to lose that competitive edge. Now you can store it without worry. So I'm going to talk about a couple of our different customers that we have. And uh, by no means that's not everyone who's using it in the cloud, these are just one that I'm most familiar with because I get to work with these uh, fantastic companies. And um, the companies are generally broken down into different areas that we're seeing people using big data. And purely from a cloud standpoint, I'm sure there's other, other ways people are using it. You get a lot of targeted advertising, a lot of image and video processing. Uh, oil and gas use it for seismic data studies. Uh, that's quite big, of course, in Australia. Uh, recommendation engines for retail. Genome analysis, Harvard University uses it for genome analysis. They're going to solve uh, new medical problems with that. I think mean, it's fantastic that they're able to enable that. Uh, financial services do risk analysis. Antivirus companies use it to create new inoculations. Um, and of course, gaming. An amazing amount of gaming information going out. Social networks, Facebook, Twitter. So this is Foursquare, not a cigarette company. And this is a visualization of people checking in and it's a little dark. I don't know if you can't, maybe you can't see it that clearly. But um, you can see where it's spread out, kind of starting in the US, it'll go over to Europe. It'll get actually very big in Japan. And for some reason, and it's not that clear on this one, it gets really big in New Zealand. And I don't know why it's that big in New Zealand. I mean, there's only like four million people there. There's, I think there's more people in the audience than there is in New Zealand. I guess if you, if you live in New Zealand, you say, well, what are you going to do? I don't know, let's play more square. Okay. <laughs> <I'm bored. laughs> There's no no TV in there. That's a great place. So long out on the Um there's a company Bank Inter. Uh, they are a uh, bank. They are a bank in Spain, but uh, it wasn't the cloud that caused the, uh, the global financial uh, crisis uh, in the EU. So uh, we'll just leave that. They do what's called uh, Monte Carlo simulations. 
trip for a credit risk analysis. And uh, the more they can run that simulation, the more value they have. And so what they do is they try, they try to run the simulation. They need to run it 400,000 times to get a minimum amount of value out of it. And when they're using their own infrastructure, it would take about 23 hours to do that. But because of that limited scale of the cloud, they're able to do it in 20 minutes. And another company in South Australia, they, uh, they do uh, analytics for wind farms. So they, I think they, they project uh, exactly how you can set up your wind farm for sort of maximum uh, efficiency. Originally, uh, the way they had everything set up, and, and, and they're using their, their own software, but they're running on the cloud. Um, it would take about 22 days for them to do one customer's worth of data. When they moved everything to the cloud, they got that scale, they were going to push that down to two days. So you can imagine in the old, their old infrastructure, if it took 22 days for them to process one customer's data, how long do you think it took for two customers? Come on, you guys are good at that, right? If you're, if you're not good at math now, it's just a good enough. So for two customers, right, 44 days. How long does it take for them to do that in the cloud? <laughs> two days. Two days. Because they've got that scale, right? 66 days for three customers, two days. Maybe a little bit extra because someone's got to write a report. It. But you know, you see how it's going. Etsy is a really neat uh, company. Um, I, I've actually used that. It's a little bit like eBay. But it's for crafts. So these are handmade things. So these are all personal items. When you go in there, if you go to Etsy, and you can actually go there anytime you want and go to this, this Earl here, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to try to create a recommendation into you, into you, for you, day one. So it'll tell you, we'll go through these different uh, tiles here, and you'll pick the ones that are most interesting to you. Right? And they'll feed that app in, and they'll use Elastic MapReduce to break that data down and create better and better recommendations. And that's actually how it starts out. It's really cool, you can try it out. The other thing they do is they do uh, GIF recommendations. And the way they do GIF recommendations is if you allow them to connect into your Facebook account, they'll use that graph and go through your friends and your contacts and find out what their likes are. And they'll pull that together and match that with the recommendation engine to try to find you better gifts for your friends. I can tell you, I'm really, really bad at online gifts. I'm single now. <laughs> Yelp is another customer I talked about a little bit before. So Yelp is very much a community-driven recommendation engine. As they get more data, these recommendations get better. Razorfish is a very interesting company. Uh, they do what's called a clickstream analysis. Clickstream analysis is basically what happens is as you traverse through the web, you start to build up some preferences. And they process those preferences and they make them available to advertisers. So for example, this is an unfortunate uh, leftover of me being an American. Um, that's a cheese head. He's a, he's a fan of the NFL football. If I find that this person goes to a lot of sports sites, when in the end, when they finally go, perhaps they go to a gaming site, buy a game, I can feed that into the gaming company and assume that sporting games are more important. This is a tiny little company. And the way their model works is that uh, we have a holiday in the US called uh, well, we have Thanksgiving. The day after Thanksgiving is called Black Friday. And that's where everybody buys everything. Right? And so their usage model is, you know, it just it shoots through the roof. And they found that they have they, they're gonna have to invest half a million, I'm oh, sorry, yeah, half a million dollars in order to have enough hardware just to process the data in time for their customers. So instead of doing that, you end up using cloud computing. I mean, it's spending about $15,000 to go process that. And then when they're done processing it, they're returning to the cloud. They were able to provide additional returns to their customers by 500%. So their customers saw that by using Razorfish, people bought, had a chance of buying something 500% higher. Our ROI is 500% higher. And they're handling like 1.7 million uh, uh, different requests a day. So that's pretty much what I have for you. Um, we talked about covering the characteristics. We talked about uh, why the cloud's big is best friend, and we covered some real, real, real use, real world use cases. So I guess at this point, uh, if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Um, here's my information. Feel free to to email me if you ask me some really uh, big data questions. I don't know the answer. To be honest with you, but hopefully uh, we actually have someone now.
based in Singapore. His entire job is to help customers use big data on AWS. And I'd be more than happy to connect you with them if, if that's something you're interested in doing. Just let me know.